Uh, welcome to our Surprise Day Game podcast, uh, one of our first Surprise Day Game podcasts about designing introductory war games. And I am delighted to welcome to the podcast uh, my old friend, Dr. Lewis Pulsifer, a freelance designer from over the water in Florida. Um, Lou is a designer of such excellent games as Britannia, Dragon Rage, Valley of the Four Winds, and recently Britannia Classic and Duel, and Stalingrad Besieged, as well as an author of uh, many books and videos and uh, such like about games and game design, um, including, I want to mention, the notable book called Game Design, How to Create Video and Tabletop Games Start to Finish. Um, so, um, Lou, please tell us a bit more about yourself before we get into the topic. Well, I've been playing games since I remember playing Candyland, so probably about 65 years. <laughs> uh, and I've been designing them almost as long. Just, you know, some people are born designers, some people come to it later. I seem to have been born. Although I never had ideas about commercial games until I went and lived in England for three years while I was working on my doctoral dissertation. Um, and I took 20 years off, which is very unusual, 20 years off from having anything to do with the game hobby because I had to make a living mm. and I learned computers and, and, and worked as a computer person for a long time and then uh, worked as a teacher for quite a long time, teaching mostly computer networking and then later game development for a few years before I retired. Um, so I have my, have had my fingers in an awful lot of things and uh, I have a PhD in military and diplomatic history, but I would not call myself a grognard wargamer, partly because to me, war games aren't about warfare, they're about generalship. Good point. And the problem there is warfare is chaotic and uncertainty is the most important thing in warfare, but that's not what people want in games. They want control. It's, it's the opposite, like war games and, and games are the opposite. Yes, indeed. Yes. And we, uh, we may get into a bit of that in, in, yes. in the conversation. Um, I should mention before we go much further that Lou and I have known each other for uh, years. Uh, it, actually, it's a long, long time. It goes, we go back to the 70s. So um, I, I probably am more of a grognard than, than you think. So I've done a lot of miniatures gaming, being in Britain where we have more more miniatures wargaming rather than the US, which has more uh, board wargaming. So a slightly different. Um, and, and I've never cared for it because it's too loosey-goosey to me. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can so, kind of understand. Miniatures that. rules tend to be something you negotiate about. There is an element of that, although I think, yeah, things have changed quite a lot and there's a lot of good good new rules from companies like um, plastic soldier company and um osprey and and others uh so you know, things have changed however yes yeah, so our topic our topic today is uh, designing introductory war games um but but lou this this topic was something that that you initiated um, I, I i believe that um, yes. uh, what, what actually led you to this particular topic? Well, I don't recall because it was quite a few years ago. I did actually design my effort at a uh, introductory war game. And uh, in the end decided I had made an unwise decision and has sat fallow since. It's, it's play tested several times. And more recently, I tried another one, but I haven't got farther than the ideas and making pieces and trying it out a little bit. So it's always an interesting topic to me because there aren't so many war gamers around as there used to be. And uh, an introductory war game is something that might help. That's it. That is, that is possible. I mean, I think the death of war gaming has been around, it's been around for, for, forever. Um, I'm not actually sure uh, whether there's less people playing war games now than there used to be. I think there's definitely less board war games sold. I'm not sure whether the hobby is dying. I think it's always dying from the point of view of us old timers, <laughs> because the type of war games that we play, probably younger people aren't as interested in. Um, but 
I suppose it raises a question, which I'm again will come on to this probably in a minute. Um, what actually is a war game? What does fantasy count? Because in the UK, at least, you've got uh, things like um, Games Workshops, Warhammer 40k. Lots of people uh, play that. It's a big, I oh, know, it's probably the major part of the uh, hobby um, over here in the UK. I'm not sure whether that's got much penetration in the US because um, I'm not really au fait with the US market. It's, it's here, but perhaps not as strong as in uh, Britain. Mm. Um, well, what, what, what we're going to talk about today, um, uh, we've, we've been thinking about this for some while, and we're going to have a look at some definitions. We're going to talk about what the audience might be, what the, what the, what the topic of introductory war games might be, um, level of granularity, you know, what kind of components we should have. The, the representation of it, modeling or simulation area, um, and number of players, things like this. So there's a whole range of things that we can talk about in terms of um, how to design an introductory war game. Um, now, perhaps somewhat, um, I'm a bit of a process-oriented person myself, and I, I, I was thinking that classically with this kind of discussion, we start with definitions. Um, if that's if that's okay with you, briefly. it's okay as long as you define it. Because <laughs> definitions are poison. Sometimes. Yeah, I wasn't gonna. Yes, I mean you could run a whole podcast on trying to define what a game is and what a war game is. Yes, yeah, I don't want to go down that route too much, but I thought having some kind of idea. Now, uh, the one I have used quite a lot in my own design war game design processing is um, is one which which was developed amongst others by Graham Longley Brown, who is um, a leading professional war games practitioner in the UK. Um, and although his definition of uh, war game is to do more to professional war game, I think it's still quite useful. And his, his, the verbose version of his definition is this, adversarial by nature, war gaming is a representation of military activities using rules, data and procedures not involving actual military forces and in which the flow of events is, is affected by and in turn affects decisions made during the course of those events by players acting for the actors, factions, factors and frictions pertinent to those military activities. Now, that's, that's a bit of a mouthful and it, I think it looks better and easier to digest on paper. Um, and so I've got the short version of that, if you like, is... It's an adversarial representation of military activities affected by decisions of players. And I think for me, those are the most, most important bits. It's about players, uh, decision-making by players um, affecting these military events, which are sequenced together in some way, and it's adversarial. So you've got players against other players generally. Is that a reasonable starting point for what we're talking about when we're talking about war games? Well, it has to be what I call an opposed game. Yeah. Because many things people call games nowadays are not opposed games. They're parallel competitions of their puzzles. Um, so it has to be an opposed game and it has to represent political entities who are arguing with other, each other uh, with means beyond diplomacy using, yeah. it has to be lethal. So the classical politics by other means, Clausewitzian yes, thing. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I would agree with that, certainly. Um, I mean, there have been some attempts at cooperative types of things, and I, it doesn't really work very easily for me. Well, I've been into designing cooperative games lately, and I have cooperative war games as mm -hmm. opposed to cooperative Euro games, which is typically yeah. what a mm -hmm. co-op game is, where the opposition is quite dangerous, but still, it's not the same as having another person as the opposition. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think we've got, we've got, we've established that we definitely want adversarial or oppositional and military activities. We've both agreed it's, it's got to be to do with it. Uh, actually, well, that's one of the big questions I had. Everybody says, oh, the best war game is Twilight Struggle. And I'm thinking, but I've always thought Twilight Struggle, it's about the Cold War. I mean, like, by definition, the main adversaries don't engage directly unless they both lose, in which, you know, at DEF CON whatever level the DEF CON is when you actually launch nuclear war. So, I mean, to me, Twilight struggled more of a political than a, well, I suppose, 
more of a political game than a war game, if you can differentiate those two. Which yes. I think you can. I haven't played it. I, I understand oh. that there's an awful lot of abstraction to it to the point where uh, there was another game of that sort that was about politics. Yeah. And yes. so I don't know how much the correspondence there is between what happens in the real world and what happens in the game. Yeah, 1960 Making of the President is the one which is very similar in, in, mm -hmm. in, in style to, to Twilight Struggle. Um, and it's, that's definitely, obviously, that's, that's Nixon v. Kennedy election. Um, yeah. See, um, I'm, I'm going to interject here yeah. that there mm -hmm. are two ways, roughly, where people say, oh, that's a really good game. One is, it's a really good game if the better player tends to win most of the time. Another is, it's a really good game if it's highly tense. Yes. Twilight Struggle is the latter. Yes. Yes, I would agree. I, would agree. I have played, I haven't played a lot of Twilight Struggle, I've played some. Um, and it's one of those games where you can get a run of cards, which just means you, you can win. You can run away with it by having a particular run of cards, which some people like. Um, I'm not that fond of that kind of thing myself. Okay, uh, let's let's move let's move on. I think um, we were we were because we want to look at introductory war games specifically, um, and I think we need to know quite what we mean by introductory. I mean, I've designed a game, or well, I was a part of the design team for Airfix Battles, the the introductory war game, um, which was produced by Modifius, and there were three of us involved in the in the design. I did quite a lot of the detail bit myself um and that is described as an introductory war game on the box that's what it, that's what it says it's it's a relatively it's a relatively small um box game um it's it uses a squared grid and it has quite a lot of counters as components but each unit is each each thing that you each unit if you like is made up of several different counters um, so they're and they're relatively few units, and it has cards. So it's not a classic, it's not a classic uh, board war game in the U.S. sense. In that it's not hex and counter. It's it's really much more related to to a miniatures war game. And certainly, I think I would describe it as an introductory miniatures war game without miniatures. Uh, yes, one of the, one of, yeah. I agree. Yeah. From from reading the. the description and we're watching Marco's review that's what it seems to be yeah. is a miniatures game without miniatures uh, and one of the reasons it didn't have miniatures in it just in slightly defensively is because we didn't really get buy-in from Airfix to supply them which was a bit of a <laughs> bit of a it's a bit <laughs> of a shame Airfix um, published it well that makes sense yeah. but they're, they're they're much more involved now um in in, in the whole of that affair um uh, because they were owned by Hornby and Hornby had some financial difficulties. I think I can understand why it was much more difficult for them at that point. But let's go going back to you. So what what do we think an introductory war game is? And are we talking about introductory in terms of co commercial success? Do we think it we need to be like m getting more people into the hobby? Is it playability? Is it accessibility? What do we actually mean by? And at this point, we should interject. When an American says war game, they mm. think of board war games. When a Britain person thinks uh, talk, says war games, they usually mean miniatures. Yes, I think that's a very important distinction. Um, yes. Yeah, definitely. Now, in, I think, uh, hmm, do you think there are some fundamental differences in complexity between miniatures games and board war games? I think that's quite important to establish. Where do you stand? Complexity, no, but scope, yes. Uh -huh. Given that you're using miniatures, it's really difficult to go higher on the tactical strategic scale than a battle, which is grand tactical. Yeah. Uh -huh. Whereas with a board game, you can do anywhere in the level because obviously you can make a board mm. game like the Airfix game that's miniatures but doesn't use miniatures, mm. but uses miniatures techniques. So I think there's a broader range that you can hit with board games and with miniatures. Um, otherwise, they do, you tend to use different techniques. You don't see morale checks much in board games. You don't see uh, cases where a unit is made up of a few pieces or troops and you take them off as they die yeah, yeah. in board games. 
but yeah, a lot of yeah. similar. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, yeah. I mean, your, I think your point about the level, the level of granularity, if you like, is a is a good one. I mean, uh, I, I also designed a definitely non not an introductory war game, which is Mission Command Normandy, which did in conjunction with some some other. Um, as other guys, Pete Connor and I designed that. And that's that's a miniatures game. That's that was designed specifically originally for our group of miniatures wargamers in Froome, in Somerset. Uh, we wanted to have something which was more of a simulation of World War II combat than the stuff that we were getting out of miniatures rules that were that were published before that. Um, and that is a kind of well, the smallest the smallest unit that you would give orders to is a company. And um, we've we've done games up to two divisions aside so like you might do a german panzer division and a german infantry division against a, a russian tank corps or something like this that's but that's really that's very very large for that normally we would do battalion brigade level on each side so uh in, and that gets using miniatures that gets really complex complicated that gets quite that gets quite complex complex very quickly and that, I think that's why you'll think the simpler uh, miniatures war games are more skirmish level. And by skirmish level, I mean one piece is one man. And usually you might only have 20 or so men per side. And then you've got all the thing about, oh, if you can go into fancy, then you have a single guy who's got lots of different powers. And that becomes possibly a whole different thing. We, we might just want to say, let's put that to one side and focus on board war games and I'll, I'll, and I'll accept that airfix battles doesn't really count so are we so we're we talking about playability accessibility commercial success what are we for introductory well my original idea mm. and where I was going with the, the games that I did design was you want something that will be successful commercially so that requires certain elements but that um, people can play and enjoy because it's simple because nowadays simple games are where everybody wants to go and short games are where everybody wants to go. And even the notes that I, I had that I showed you from yeah. quite a few years ago, I read them now and say, well, no, that's not true anymore, Lou. We got we to change yeah. that even further. Yeah. Um, so we're stuck with the market. Um, and for example... I know I'm jumping ahead. A two-player game won't cut it. Mm. Now, it can be a two-player game that allows partners. Then you can have four. That's possible. Mm. Or a two-player game where you can have a three-player version. And the one that I did design was two players with a three-player version. Um, Single-player versions are quite popular yeah. now, but I think it's with the uh, people who are already war gamers. And so I don't think it's necessary. And as you said, cooperative just puts off too many people who are war gamers. And you want a game that not only attracts beginners, but will be acceptable to play by the grognards or semi-grognards. Yeah, I think solo is an interesting, it's an interesting one because um, it, it always used to be said that most Avalon Hill SPI type games are played solo. Uh, because, well, it, uh, I think I think the excuse was in the US, it was actually, it, it was before internet, quite hard to get opponents. So even though almost all the games were two player, most of the time people were playing them as solo. So having specifically solo, um, especially especially nowadays with COVID, it, you know, it suggests that solo games solo games seem to be getting more traction in any in any case. And having a solo mode is very much de rigueur. In, in any type of board game, I think. I mean, I, we have a solo mode in Ethics Battles, for example, which a lot of people really, really like. I'm quite, I'm quite pleased with that, actually. I don't like that people actually do enjoy playing Ethics Battles solo. Um, I suspect that's older people who've got lots of Ethics models who, who just think, ah, well, I haven't got anybody else, but I've got my models and I can at least play on my own. Um, but yeah, of course, I, I, a co-op game can always be played solo. That's true, yeah, absolutely. So we're talking about simple, short. And I think the commercially successful is important. I, uh, I keep referring to Ethics Battles. I mean, it's only had limited commercial success. And I think that's partly to do with the fact that it is really a miniatures game rather than a board war game. So it hasn't had 
great deal of traction in the US. And I think that's probably... It doesn't have plastic pieces either. And, and it doesn't have plastic pieces. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that one. <laughs> I think we will definitely come back to that one. Um, I, I was interested, you were saying maybe two plus is better than just two. Um, because conventionally, war games have always been... Now, if you look at all the range, if I look at all the range of SPI and Avalon Hill games I've got on my shelves, they're virtually all two-player. Well, any historical situation comes down to two-player, even when two of the countries on uh, opposite side, on one side, hate each other, like the Soviet Union and, and the United Kingdom. They're still on the same side in the war. Um, but you can make games be multi-sided, even though history history isn't multi-sided. Um, but the, from the point of view of attracting people to play, I'm accustomed to going to college and university game clubs. And you just don't see two player games played at those because there are a lot of people and they want to accommodate everybody. And so yeah. they tend to play games for more than two. And two player games just don't cut it at all. Two player games are for people, either a husband and wife or spouse um, mm -hmm. like to play games with each other, just the two of them. Or it's the grognard, the war game ghetto idea. Yes. I call it the war game ghetto. It's two old guys playing with <laughs> half inch counters on a hex board. That's the war game ghetto. Sure. It's something that younger people just aren't interested in. Oh, I've been in there. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely been in the war game ghetto. Uh, yeah, uh, I suppose in some senses, because I'm older, it's quite an attractive uh, genre. Um, I like that. I personally like that kind of game, and and also it's it's harder to design things that you don't. I'm going to say you don't like. That's not quite. What I mean, it's harder to design things which are outside your familiarity zone, if you like. Um, so um, it may, it may be that the traditional war game designer isn't going to be able to readily and very easily design something which might meet our criteria, simple, short, commercially successful, but not necessarily just to play, you know, team, teams yes. or, more than, or more than two, it's gonna be quite difficult. Um, anyway, we'll come back to that too, I think. The, the, we were looking, we're also gonna look at the audience. I think we talked a bit about the audience um, at being different in the, in, in the UK and, and US. Um, and I think that one of the things we looked at was, who are we trying to attract? Are we trying to attract new people into the hobby? And I think well, basically introductory war game is trying to do that, isn't it? I mean, it's- Yeah, yeah. Why, why bother why otherwise? Why bother otherwise, exactly. Um, so we're trying to get uh, either non-gamers into war games, board war games, or we're trying to get gamers to switch or at least partially switch to into board wargaming, I guess. Well, we're in a situation nowadays where uh, at WBC, I had a couple of French people come up to talk to me. And one of them said, if you, and, and I'll preface this, in France, they still seem to be more open to war games than a lot of other places. But uh, he said, if you come to somebody and say, I want you to play this war game, they'll turn off. They don't want to know. Yeah. But if you come and say, I want you to play this interesting game, which is about history, <laughs> then they might try it and they might like it. And that's what we're up against. There's an awful lot of, well, it's partly pacifistic attitudes, but it's partly people don't want to know about history because history is ugly. Yeah. And there's much less interest in history. The farther we get from World War II, the less interest there is in history. And the more that people invent history in their minds and assume that's the way history was instead of finding out what actually happened. They don't really want to know what actually happened. They want it to be whatever they wanted it to be. Yes. I mean, in a, in a, I mean, I agree with you. Um, I, I found that with a lot of the people, the younger people that I, that I play with, it's, and I think it goes to the heart of one of the things, one of the other topics, one of the other, I was going to say topic, the other things we want to talk about, which is this topic theme, whatever that might mean, um, that, that, that we would want to use here. Um, and I, 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 think, I think territory is important in the sense of, you talked about France, have the French people maybe having a specific way of looking at things. If it's in Germany, you're going to have to have a, a different approach um, 
there at least there would at least be a feeling that World War II might not be the best theme to pick, you know. Um, so, and in the U.S. about Germany. I was told once by a producer of a, a Middle Earth video game that Germany was one of their best markets. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to the notion that Germans don't want to play war games, what it amounts to apparently is that German shop owners who were older people and might have remembered World War II at that time didn't want to have those in their family game shop. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But the people were okay with it. It's just yes. the shop owners weren't. And the success of a video game, video games tends to show that. Yeah, I think there's certainly there's certainly a but, big a, a growing war game market, board war game market in 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 Germany for sure. But the certainly you growth. can't have swastikas and so yeah, on. Yeah, you can't have any of that. But that may oh. be yeah. But I th- and, uh, but I think the US and the UK markets are very are very different. The Anglo-Saxon markets tend to be quite different, and that that might well affect how we approach doing our introductory war game. I have a slight concern about about myself, I have a slight concern about this, um, this sanitization or potential sanitization. Now, maybe it's because if we want to be commercially successful, we have to sanitize the war game. I mean, I, I don't go to the lengths in my miniatures games of having the dead guys lying down on the floor, you know. I don't, we don't, do, some people do, but generally don't do that kind of thing, largely because it's just more complicated and time consuming. Um, but there is that problem, war game, we're talking, we are talking about, you know, war. We're talking about military conflict, which then generally does involve people actually getting killed and killing each other. Um, so deaths is definitely an issue. And uh, there's, a, there's a part of me which says, we need to avoid the complete sanitization of it. But then again, we need to get over the, that, that feeling that people don't want to play war games because of the death and destruction in it. One of the reasons why I keep fantasy games always in mind is people Mm. don't seem to mind monsters dying in fantasy games. I mean, Dungeons and Dragons is really popular. Um, Small World is really popular, and that's a great trick. Small World is a war game, but they make a joke out of it, and it's all fantasy creatures, and somehow it doesn't bother people. Yes, that may well be that may well be the best approach. And in fact, if you look at some of the successful, at least pseudo war games like Dominant Species, which is a big complicated, I don't know if you've played Dominant Species. Ch- 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 I've Ch- seen people play. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of people describe that as a war game. Although, as I think, as you would, you would say, it doesn't involve political states no. or anything like that, but it's got some of the techniques. What Chad Jensen is very good at is translating the techniques of one genre uh, into another genre, I should have said was unfortunately because he was unfortunately no longer with us. Um, but you know, one of the best designers for translating Euro game mechanics into war game mechanics and vice versa. Uh, it was a massive contribution to to game design um, for for doing for doing that. Um, but if we're going to bring, I suppose, you know, within the game, we want to bring people into the hobby. So I suppose we have to confront that sanitization head on and maybe maybe our introductory game has to perhaps be sanitized or fantasy or something some topic which isn't well another uh, thing that sensibly military the higher level of granularity does is if you're moving armies around and, and fleets and so on you're much less likely to think of it as anybody dying than if you're moving individual small units or in, or individual persons yes yeah definitely um it, uh, it's also i'm gonna I'm, I'm, I'm skipping to topic a little bit here um in a sense if we have a if we if we are looking at theme or topic i i, I tend to split things up i said i i tend to use theme to mean a, a veneer a veneer of something uh, if you look at something like um memoir 44 which is ostensibly a World War II combat game. Uh, I see that as a as a a game that has got a veneer of World War II on it, but isn't anything to do really with World War II tactics. It doesn't have. It has so it's so divorced from World War II um, actual 
battlefield tactics that it, it horrifies me sometimes when I hear school teachers use it for teaching about World War Two, and you think uh -huh. ah, um, because it's so it's so game. It's a game, you know. It's uh, I call it an atmosphere or a decoration. Oh yeah, atmosphere. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I don't um, use the word theme anymore because it means so many different yes, things. Sure. Atmosphere is quite a good one. I, I, I quite like the atmosphere as a, as a way of describing something which isn't a simulation or a model of an actual situation. Yes, and, and they tend to be on things that aren't models. They, they See, to me, a model has a correspondence between what happens in reality and what happens in the game. And the strategies people follow are, are like strategies that people followed in the yeah. real thing. Yeah. And you don't get that when you just have an atmosphere. I agree, um, and uh, I've had I've had discussions with a lot of people about whether a game is necessarily a model, or whether it's what sells games <laughs> is the story. When people turn a game over in a, a game shop, they read about the story much more than about how the game works, and that's why they buy the game. I think that's no bad thing because I I I. I um... Yeah, humans are built for storytelling, aren't they? Mm -hmm. So I think having that narrative as a starting point, you're, you're, uh, I'm bearing in mind here that we're talking about an introductory war game. So we're not, this isn't going to be hardcore. I think, you know, once, once they've got through the introductory war game, you know, maybe, maybe they'll, I don't know, progress, if that's the right word, to having a more of a hardcore experience, getting more involved in, the, in, in, in other games. But for an introductory level, I'm not, I'm not sure it matters much. Um, about whether it's a simulation or a or, a, or an atmosphere style game um I, i'm i'm not sure if, going back to topic we're, and a part of this is if, we, if we're looking at topic if we look the most the best topic for marketing purposes, you want to sell a lot of these games conventionally the conventional wisdom would be world war ii wouldn't it be yes most most or or, or Napoleonic's maybe Napoleonics. Pants, maybe. The, the game that I made was a Napoleonic style game. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I suspect World War II is more popular yet, but I don't know. Yes, yes. Uh, There's uh, a publisher of a magazine that has a game in every issue, not strategy and tactics. And he told me that whenever the game was World War II, he'd get it, I think he said a third again as many. Oh, same. right, yeah. Well, that's a big, that's a big push for World War Two. That's a big yes. Yeah. Um, if we were looking at, <clears throat> if we were seriously looking at the sanitization issue, then we might want to either up the up the level of granularity and have it, as you were suggesting, have it as a higher level game, so it's at least at least a kind of, you know, core army level type of thing. So we, we haven't got the problem with deaths directly or fantasy. I'm very resistant to the idea of an intro war game being a fantasy game. I know it. It could easily it could easily work. Um, what you need is a game that can be both historical and fantasy. But unfortunately, World War II doesn't work. Now Romans, old melee days. Yeah. Then you could possibly add fantasy in. Uh, but once you get to firepower times, then the fantasy is more difficult to integrate in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I designed a small game once that was two brothers whose uh, father had died, they're the king under mysterious circumstances, and they're fighting each other to see who's going to succeed. So they had knights and pikemen, and they didn't have any gunpowder. Well, I could add a fantasy onto that with a wizard and a, and a dragon yes. that flew and so on and so forth. And um, that actually might be something I could turn into an introductory war game. I don't know. Um, but yes, I, I agree that just having a game that's just fantasy maybe isn't the best idea. I mean, your your game Dragon Rage which is a war game, isn't it? Oh, yes. It's definitely a war game, and it's a fantasy war game. And Valley of the Four Winds is another fantasy, fantasy war game. So there's track record there. Um, but I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have thought that either of those was the kind of thing you'd have as a if we were if we're looking at an, our introductory war game to be a kind of typical in some way a typical <laughs> uh war game i think you're looking at probably yeah as we said earlier world war ii 
um, ancients or, or Napoleonics, but but not fantasy. And we're, look, we're probably looking at a higher level thing above skirmish level, and it's a board game. Um, and that raises the that raises the question of who is the player. Um, do we need to identify in the game who we are when we're when we're playing that game? Well, I can tell you, uh, GMT, who publishes a vast mm. number of war games, is not really interested in Britannia, and there's two reasons. One, there's no one you can identify uh -huh. as you, and two, it's a planner's game, and the acquisition guy likes very uh, improvisational games. Okay. You know, he thinks that Britannia is a game where if you make a mistake early on, you're dead, which isn't true, but that's what he thinks. So yeah. that's the planner's game part of it. But more important there is they're not interested in games where they can't identify who they are. Right. Even if it's not a, 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 a real avatar where if they die, they lose. Yeah. Um, nonetheless, they want to have somebody that they can identify with, a general. Again, yeah, right. going back to generalship, I'm Napoleon. Yeah, sure. Well, yeah. that goes that goes all the way back to I remember, I remember the early advertising of SPI, which was all about yeah. Uh, you you are Hannibal. This is your situation. What are you going to do about it? You know that's the kind you, of you can change history. Yes. yes. Yes, that's which is which is a big attraction. Um, is that still? I mean, you said GMT, but then you know we're talking GMT is hardcore, isn't it? Really? Are we talking for an introductory game? Do we need? Do we need a real avatar? I, I suppose we might do because with video games, particularly with your first person shooters and stuff like that, you've got a real avatar. You've got an avatar. Let's face it, you are, you are usually somebody or you're a party. So do we I would, yeah. I would say the younger generation is accustomed to having an avatar because their favorite games are role-playing games. Even if they play a lot of video games, even if they play board games, they tend to be role-playing gamers first. And so they're accustomed to having an avatar. Even if they play in the kind of uh, role-playing game where nobody dies, which is quite common storytelling kind of game, nonetheless, they're accustomed to having that avatar. So a compromise, and I've, I've tried this in a few games, mm. and it does make a difference. Um, in Hastings 1066, there's a representation of William and Harold yeah. because in battles of that age, if the leader died or was captured, the army tended to fall apart. Yeah. Now, the army is at a disadvantage when those guys die in the game, but you can still win. It's just not very likely. Yeah, yes. And I've just been reading uh, about Battle Bosworth because I'm, I'm doing, well, as you know, I'm, I'm involved in redeveloping Kingmaker. Uh, that's a whole different story. Um, uh, but yes, at Bosworth, um, Richard III is kind of losing the battle, but he spots Henry Tudor slightly separated out from his main army and he charges with his retainers and, and there's a kind of bit of a fight. And, and, he, and, he, and as we know, he gets killed. So, so the, the battle effectively ends with the death of Richard III. But if Henry Tudor had died, if he'd killed Henry Tudor, that would have been the end because the whole point of that of dynastics is that it's gotta be one or other. Um, God alone knows what happened if both of them die actually. It, it always amazes me <laughs> always amazes me reading about those old battles that there was no effective second in command frequently so mm, if the yeah. leader died whether he was a king or not the army just fall apart yes yeah true. and it, it's not the case in in modern battles so there's a, a very strong differentiation there if we're doing world war ii though or we're doing napoleonics to an extent um, and well actually we're we doing any I was just saying advanced civilization, even if it's an ancient civilization, it's a relatively advanced civilization. I'm talking beyond medieval levels of, of organization, um, which is slightly disparaging to medieval armies. But if where you've got a, uh, we've got a more developed command structure, so your avatar then is the command team, effectively, however, mm -hmm. however that is constituted, whether it be... Um, Napoleon and his staff and marshals, or, or, or it could be only a World War II general and his staff with a very potentially decentralized arrangements for command, um, where somebody will take over if the general um, is killed. And even to some extent, you've got that in the Roman army as well. 
I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so that would give us our avatar. And I think that's, that's a, a, reasonable, um, a reasonable thing to, to, uh, to suggest for our introductory game. And, and we've- Of course, here you have another question. Do you want this to be like a typical game or do you want it to be like an, sort of an ideal how games should be? And a typical war game does not have an avatar like that. Yeah. Well, not one where you die and you lose, or even close. Yes, I don't think we need, I don't think we should have a, sorry, I don't think we should have an avatar. I think we should need to have a more of a decentralized thing. I think you could have a situation where if your leader dies, as you were suggesting in your 1066 game, if your leader dies, it's a disadvantage, but you could still, you could still win somehow i think that was that would work also in a, in a very in, in a sense for an introductory game you don't want you don't want oh my leader's died i've lost type of approach Be, you know because that means there's always a temptation you just target the leader which isn't what we want to do in an introductory well, game you, you can design the game so you can't target the leader yes. but the problem is a lot of people well i have a very low opinion of the average capability of a game player especially one who doesn't play war games um, they're not very good because they only play games a few times and they move on to the next yeah. game. They never learn the strategies, really. Mm -hmm. They're just learning the puzzle solutions that are presented by the game immediately. Um, anyway, uh, what happens is those people will take their chances and then blame the game when the chance doesn't yes. come out. Yeah. So you don't want to present them with too many chances that are going to make or break the game. Yes, I would agree. I mean, I, I mean I've played I've played a lot of uh, war war games with military or ex-military. Now they know what they're doing. Gen generally, they will have been trained that they know you have to have an objective and you keep to the you keep you have a plan. You, you follow that plan. The objective has to be a flexible plan. But there's that objective, so it's not they they're not chances. Um, and most most players, particularly actually, particularly if they're switching from Euro games to war games they're playing in a very very different way because i think with even though you're a lot of euro games might be called strategy games they're using strategy in a completely different way from the word strategy in a war game because in a euro in a euro game very often your strategy is which mix of this this wide array of objectives am i going to use how am i going how much how much of my resource am i applying to this huge wide range array of victory point objectives now, to my mind, that's not that's that's dispersion. That's that's not strategic concentration on objectives. That's dispersion of effort. And the trouble is, a lot of Euro games force you to do dispersion because that's how you get points. And if you ignore if you ignore a whole area, uh, or or only put a little bit in just to defend it a bit, you 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 lose because you're not getting the points that you need to get for the area. So there's no. It's a very different approach. I have found that with with Eurogamers coming into wargaming, they flounder a little bit because then they don't they don't have that idea of concentration. They haven't learned the military strategy way of doing things. Exactly, exactly. Um, what they've learned is to find the solutions that have been put into the game by the designer, and there might yeah. be four or five multiple paths to victory. Yes, yes. But they just follow those, and that's all. It. If you don't follow those, you're not going to win. Yeah, yeah. So we don't follow one of them. Yeah. I think that's a key difference, I think, between we're more, more generalizing about war game design rather than Euro game design. In, in a sense, it's one of the reasons why I've come back to doing more war game design now than I, because I used to do quite a lot of Euro games and I still dabble now, but I'm focusing much more on war game design because I prefer this, this kind of approach where it's providing um, what we talked about before, uh, adversarial representation of military activities affected by decisions of our players and your player you're trying to develop the decision making potential of the players in, in, well, in i used to play situations. yeah i used to play with uh college kids as i say mm -hmm, mm -hmm. until the, the pandemic but uh some years ago we were playing a space war game and it was like four or five people and one of the players understood military strategy and i wasn't playing of course and he and I would know what was going to happen in the game long before the other players had figured it out. He and I knew who was going to win, which was usually him. And the other players, <laughs> yeah, yeah. by the time they figured it out, it was too late. Yes. And that's yes. where deficient in strategy comes into play. Yes, definitely. Because these were people who played lots of 
military style games because they were play testing my games every week. Um, but they just didn't have that. They hadn't learned it or something. Yeah, it's not. Well, it, uh, it's not something that's ta taught unless it's taught in the military area mm. or unless you're a, a, like a military historian of some type. When you, you kind of learn these, you have to read Clausewitz. As, which is ought, that ought to be a standard thing that, that people say, isn't it? Read Clausewitz or Jomini, actually. But anyway, that's that's a whole new thing to talk about later on. Maybe. Um, we've looked at level of activity as, as well. We, I think you were talk, you were saying that really, yeah, if we want to avoid the problem of having to sanitize the deaths away a bit, we probably ought to be looking at a higher level, which be which would be uh, what operational or strategic at least, uh, rather than rather than battles although i mean having said that um if you say war game to a lot of people they think battle uh, and and the re the, attra mm -hmm. yeah, the attraction of of an introductory war game that has a battle as its focus is that at least it you, you know you, you're generally going to get a decision within a a known finite duration for in, in game in game time well, you can design a grand strategic game you, you that can. still gives yes. you, but, but what it does is the battle games don't require that strategic sense. They only require a tactical sense. Yes. And tactical is a lot easier. I mean, yeah. yes. Are we my idea of battles in general is the, 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 <laughs> the commanders can't do much in, in melee battles to really control things once the battle gets going. They can occasionally, you know, mm. what did Alexander do? He led his companions and so yeah, on in the right yeah. place at the right time. But in general, there's not a lot of control that you have after you set up. And I've always looked at miniatures battles that way. There's a lot of times there's not much you can control once they've set up and gone. It's, it's just sort of happens and that's that. <laughs> yes. I mean, this, this to me came back to what, what are we, what are we trying to do with an introductory war game? Are we trying to educate, entertain, inform, it's very BBC, educate, inform, ent entertain, or, or lead them into, into the world of war games so they can go and do something, some other war games later on. And maybe it's all of that. Are we trying to, in other words, if we, when we look at it in terms of battle, in terms of tactical or operational or strategic, are we trying to teach them a bit about operational and strategic methods rather than tactical? Is that what we're, is that what we're saying our typical war game needs to, to look at, operational and strategic or uh, operational or strategic rather than tactical? In other words, we're saying your typical war game, particularly a typical US board war game, really is operational strategic i'm thinking things like no retreat the whole no retreat series world war ii um, stuff. i don't know if you don't know if you're familiar with no retreat that's what well, major world war ii um thing which, which came out ooh, probably 10 years ago but it's still they're still it's still around still played a lot and that is definitely operational uh, operational level so you've got an eastern front game you've got a, a battle of france game things like that so um do you think it's important that we teach that in our introductory game, in a strategic operational sense? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure. And and when I did my intro war game, I tried to incorporate both. I had a area board for the strategic part, and then a battle board, uh -huh. the tactical part. But that takes too long. Yeah. Uh, you've got to do one or the other, I think, which is one of the reasons why I put it aside. Um, we're, we're actually trying to teach people that war games are different from Euro games, for example, in the ways that you yes. talked about. And uh, that you focus on strategies, not on mechanics. A lot of, I, I remember reading uh, something, somebody said uh, he, he played a lot of Euro games and they'd play one or two or three times and then they'd go on to the next thing. And yeah. so they focused mm -hmm. on the mechanics. Yeah. And then they started to play games a lot more times and they focused on the strategy and it was completely different. Mm. And to me, when Avalon Hill came out, games came out and I was 12 years old, what they told me was you could have a game that didn't depend entirely on luck, that only partly depended on luck, where intelligence made a big difference but it wasn't like chess, which is a puzzle, really. Um, 
And perhaps that's what you want to introduce people to, the idea that these games are different <clears throat> and they're different in a way that a lot of people enjoy. Um, and they return study. They, they, they reward, reward some study or really thinking hard about what you're doing. And yet we want a game that's not too long and doesn't have too many choices. And that's why, among other things, I think it needs to be kept to 10 or 15 units on a side. 10 or 15 yeah. assets that you yes. move around. Yeah. Okay, good. This is going to be a nice segue into the components we have. But I wanted, before we went there, I just wanted to recap because we've been talking for quite a long time, trying to recap on where we are in a sense. And I'll do that at the start of part two. So please do join us in a sec. <laughs>